Welcome to the latest episode in my history of Dark Ages England. This is the story of how the country came into being. It follows the Anglo-Saxon invasion of what was former Roman Britannia. And if you find it greatly, then click the like button. Episode 17, Saxon Kings. Mixed fortunes with kings, but Bishop Dunstan is the one thread through all. A note on the royal succession seems appropriate at this point, as the kings come and go quickly. Athelstan was followed by his half-brother Edmund in 940 to 946. He was the eldest legitimate son of Edward the Elder. Edred is 946 to 955, the younger brother of Edmund. He's followed by Edwig, Edmund's son, Edgar, the younger brother of Edwig. He had two wives, Athelflad and Ailfrith. Edward II follows them all up and is known as Edward the Martyr and is the son of Edgar. The common thread throughout this reign is a monk and eventually Archbishop of Canterbury, St Dunstan. He first came to note at the end of Athelstan's reign, where on entering the court, jealousies were instantly aroused and courtiers one day attacked him, threw him into a cesspit from where he managed to drag himself out and took refuge in a nearby friend's home. Surviving a severe case of blood poisoning from the ordeal, he decided to be celibate and become a monk. At the beginning, one gets the impression he was a right pain. He obviously had great learning, which had been given to him by the monks at Glastonbury, where he was schooled. He also devoured any books on any subjects. He seems, though, to have had few social skills with his peers. With Athelstan's death, the Irish Vikings, under Olaf Guthrithson, King of Dublin, invade the Old Realm of Northumbria in 939 and, sweeping down from the northeast coast, retake York. Olaf led an incursion below the Humber, but this was repulsed. King Edmund, complete with an army, confronted Olaf at Leicester. But the Archbishops of York and Canterbury had already agreed a peace treaty, which both sides concluded. For the next few years, York was part of the Kingdom of Dublin. Edmund I summoned Dunstan to court in 940, where he instantly got the backs up of the established order. And Edmund seems to have believed a plot that Dunstan's enemies had dreamt up. He was soon banished from court. Later the same day, while out hunting, Edmund was nearly killed when a hart, that's a deer, he was chasing, jumped to its death over some cliffs, followed by many hounds. His horse at first refused to pull up, and Edmund, praying to God that he would reinstate his learned monk if the horse would stop because he realised Dunstan's innocence. He found himself looking into the abyss as his horse stopped precipitously at the edge. Edmund immediately scampered after Dunstan, who had not yet travelled far, and reinstated him as a minister at court. Dunstan set about reforming the monastic life to that based on St Benedict, which meant a much stricter and more orderly regime. This took time and teaching. Also, the regime initially was only from what Dunstan had heard second-hand. Dunstan, as part of his court duties, was to act as a kind of foreign minister. He secured the alliance of the King of the Scots by making him Fief of Cumberland. This had the effect of squeezing Northumbria into staying peaceful, partly due to the borders now being part of the Scots King's charge. Edmund's death highlights the problems of disorder within the fledgling state. He was feasting at Puckle Church, what a wonderful name, in what is now Gloucestershire, when a robber named Leofa sat himself down at one of the tables. A thane recognised the interloper, told him to leave, whereupon Leofa drew a knife and stabbed the thane. Edmund sprung to the thane's side and pulled Leofa around by the hair, but was himself stabbed to death in the ensuing fight. This was in 946. Earlier, in 943, there was a change of king in York. Olaf Guthrithson had been followed by Olaf Seatrixson, 
But the people rebelled against this kingship and replaced him with Guthrithson's brother, Regnold. Edmund seized his chance of division within the Viking kingdom and took an army to York and expelled both of them. On Edmund's death in 946, Edred, his brother, became king and the treaty with Northumbria was extended. However, two years later, in 948, upturns Eric Bloodaxe. He revolted, or got the people of York to revolt, and declared himself king. Eric had the backing of the Archbishop of York, Wolfston, who unilaterally seems to have decided that Northumbria should be free of the south, and Edred took up the challenge by taking an army and devastating the country around York, burning crops and ranging over to Ripon, where St Wilfrid's Cathedral was burnt to the ground. The only fight was between a party cut off from the main army and Eric Bloodaxe. On coming to the rescue, Edred found Eric had done a runner and fled north. For a while, no real knowledge of Eric Bloodaxe's whereabouts are certain. Then, in 952, Eric returns and is declared King in York. It was over two years before anything happened. Dunstan had had Archbishop Wolfston put under house arrest when he was on a visit to the south. In the end, it was Olaf Citrixen who made an alliance with Edmund in 954 that came to battle with Eric in Edendale. Eric's army was overwhelmed by numbers and once again, peace fell on the area. Dunstan had from the beginning allowed Northumbria to maintain the Dane law and in one respect, his strategy failed as the uprising under Eric showed. But looked at it in a different light, it succeeded because it was settled without the need for Edred to raise an army. It was done for him in-house, so to speak. Edwig followed Edred, this is 955, and there was trouble for Dunstan from the day of the coronation. Edwig had contracted an uncanonical marriage. He was a third cousin of his wife, and to add to his unpopularity with the priesthood, decided to go and have some hanky-panky in his quarters while the coronation service was taking place. As he was the star turn of the coronation, he was soon missed, and Dunstan, it was elected, would be the one to go and drag him back. The other prelates seeming to think it maybe wasn't a good idea. Dunstan caught Edwig with his mother-in-law, showing her daughter some of the more interesting sexual exploits one can get up to, especially as a threesome. The problem here was Edwig had the power, and once he was king, Dunstan was exiled to the continent. But Edwig was only four years with the top job before he pegged it, and his brother Edgar became numero uno in the kingdom. It is worth noting that the Worcester manuscript of Anglo-Saxon Chronicle has Edwig's brother, Edgar, as King of Mercia at the same time as Edwig is King of Wessex. But as the Peterborough manuscript has Edgar being 16 on his accession to the full crown of Wessex and Mercia on Edwig's death in 959, this would have made him about 12 being King of Mercia, which seems unlikely. Whichever way, in the end, Edgar was crowned in 959 and Dunstan returned from exile. From this point, the reformation by Dunstan of the monasteries and the monastic life was undertaken with new vigour. The document that underpinned it was the Regularis Concordia. It laid down the rules for the monks, including emphasis on praying for the king and his family. In 963, the ASC has many new monasteries being paid for by Edgar, including Peterborough being rebuilt. This had lain in ruins from the previous century. In addition, monks eject many of the existing clerics from the churches and monasteries because they refused to adhere to the new rules for stricter observance. In the next episode... Slavery is reduced on order of the church. If you found this video greatly, please give it a click a rooney thumbs up. Also push the subscribe button and ring that bell to get notification of new releases. 
I publish a new video every Monday with occasional bonus episodes on Thursday. Please comment and spread the word on social media outlets and history forums. Thank you.